The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. But the staff placed the wrong piano on the stage. Instead of the Bosendorfer 290, it's a small piano. Some of the keys get stuck. The pedals don't work properly. And to boot, the piano is terribly out of tune. Jarrett has a decision to make. Do I get up and perform in front of the over 1,000 people that are waiting for me, or do I pull back? Benjamin Wendell says it's time to stop pretending that everything is fine, because flourishing comes from hardship. Next on Life Today. Welcome to Life Today. I'm Randy Robinson. Tammy is with me. Hello. And Tammy, I have a question for you, Tammy. Because okay. I know I know you've been through some really difficult moments in life. Yes, definitely. What we would call catastrophic. Yes. Have you ever thought of a catastrophe as good? Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. I've it, not. And that, that's that's why today's guest is, is mm -hmm. interesting. He's got a book called Good Catastrophe. It's written mm -hmm. by Benjamin Wendell. He's an author, speaker, was a longtime pastor, and he joins us. Good to have hey, you, it's, it's a joy hey. to be with you both today. So the obvious question I set up is is the title of your book. What what in the world is a good yeah. catastrophe? I think in our culture today, we struggle to see those, not just words together, but those concepts placed yeah. together. Sure. And yet when you look at the subject of challenge and pain and trouble in scripture, you do see that there's this symbiotic relationship between our challenges and our growth. Hmm. And so I wanted to provide people with a blueprint to find their way through pain. After 20 years of pastoring, I think we'd recognize there are some dark clouds that are formed on yeah. the horizon of our culture and we need to let the light in. And that's what Good Catastrophe is all about. I was just going to ask about your accent. You, you, were you pastoring in the, in Australia or were you pastoring here or both? I've pastored in both the US and Australia, but I've spent the last 14 years back in Australia. So uh, you're hearing you're hearing the Aussie accent. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Well, and it's the same wherever you go, you know. Uh, we're reading scriptures from the Middle East, right? But right. We're here in America and Australia. We all mm -hmm. face these things. As a pastor, you, you've seen so many different things. What are the some of the things that, that shaped your perspective on the painful parts of life. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a pastor's kid, so I'm raised in mm -hmm. ministry. I think then when you get into it and then you're in it for 20 years and you're pastoring and doing church work, you start to see the true lived human experience, people's actual lives. You visit hospital beds, you walk with people through financial collapse, you're there at funerals. I think it gives you an empathy of the challenges and the complexities of life. Here's one of the things I learned. God potentially could save us from all pain, mm -hmm. but he, he doesn't. Mm. That's not the normal Christian life. And yet a lot of people like me were raised almost with this unintentional narrative that if you put God first, follow Jesus, somehow you'll get a pass from challenges and trials and adversity in life and then mud gets thrown at the canvas of our lives and we don't know how to deal with it. And we have younger generations that are in desperate need of resilience. The biblical version of resilience is called hope. And hope is a dynamic that goes to work in the midst of our pain. It's there for us in our most difficult moments. And it's the turn that God uses to bring those challenges and imperfections for our good and for our growth. Mm the hope and the turn. Yeah. It's not just waiting for us right. to get on the other side of whatever our circumstances are, but it's in the middle of it with us. Hope is right now available to you. If you're going through something really hard and many people will ask like, why does bad stuff happen to good mm. people? Why does God allow these things to happen? Do we have an answer pastor to that or, or not really? Or is it the maturity of our faith to say, look, I don't understand. I don't understand, but my faith says I will believe through it all. Yeah, I, you know, you talk about hope in the midst of the challenge. Mm. And we really do need to decouple hope from our circumstances. 
And so I call that outcome-based hope. In other words, God, if you do A, B, and C for me, then I'll put my trust in you. Mm. Well, what about hope when we don't get the endings we want? I've had some of those in my own life. Yeah. And the question you asked, I think so many people are searching for, God, where are you in my pain? Where are you in my trauma? Yeah. The big discovery of this book is that God is there. He's there in the midst of our storms Mm. and our trials and our challenges. But maybe he shows up in unexpected ways and he works in us in ways that we don't anticipate. Yeah. So he's there. Mm. Absolutely. You've you've got a term from uh, Tolkien. Yes. Uh, you, you add the words EU to the word catastrophe, you catastrophe. Yes. What is that? Well, that's Tolkien's word. Uh, you know, the writer of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit and the movies and so forth that we watch today, he coined this term, you catastrophe. So for him, it was a writing philosophy. And when I read the word, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's no native English word that captures what he, he captures in this, in this thought. And he had this idea when he was writing that when all seems lost with the main character, there's no way out. It's the darkest, it's the midnight hour. There would be a sudden turn towards joy, a good catastrophe in the middle of your pain, God at work. That narrative is weaved throughout all of his books, which have become movies. And I chose that as the title for the book because I want to show people hope is not reserved for your good days. Hope is not reserved for when you think you can figure it out yourself. Hope is there when you feel like my life is a catastrophe right now. Hope is available. It's interesting you mentioned that, that literary term because, you know, there is that whole hero's arc in stories. Yes. That, well, if, if you understand that, you see it yeah. in all the stories. And that dark night of the soul yes. is a key element. And I, I, you just, you look at that and you go, is this just something writers invented or is this sort of a stamp that God placed in our soul that says, this is part of the process to get you where I want you to be. Mm. I, I just, I know I've struggled with it. I'm, I know Tammy struggled. Yeah, I think we all sure. struggle yeah. with this idea of a good God allowing pain mm-hmm. and difficulty to get us where he wants us to be. But I mean, is that is that the way you see it? Is it just well, a part of the artist creating the... Firstly on Tolkien, and I'll speak to that. Tolkien was a Christian. Tolkien converted C.S. Lewis. And so I think his writings are a reflection of his Christian faith. He said the cross is the greatest you catastrophe in human history. Mm. Um, In terms of processing pain, you know, when my younger son was attacked just a number of years ago, um, horrifically by a a rot wheeler. Mm. And I still remember that day and uh, the panic and and the trauma and just, God, where are you right now? When you're a parent and your child goes through something like that, it changes it from being an intellectual conversation of what ifs, like, but this is my life. I'm experiencing loss. I'm experiencing pain. God, where are you in this? Mm. If our idea of hope means this, good outcomes here and now, we'll be left wanting. Yeah. If we can stretch our perspective of hope to an eternal perspective, see life under the sun, life here and now, the way God sees it, that will include hardship, trials and pain, Mm -hmm. but hope is at work in that, even though we understand our ultimate answers are not here and now, but heaven is real. And the heavenly perspective is crucial in the Christian worldview. What, what happened with your son? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah please. <laughs> uh, he's a beautiful, he's a beautiful little guy, you know, just a lovely little guy. And it's, it's been amazing to see God at work. It's one thing in your own life, but in your children's life. He made a miraculous recovery. Amen. Um, just in multiple ways, how he was, his face was spared. It was a life-threatening Thanks injury. God. Wow. Uh, he has a, a large scar. Uh, he went for his jugular and it's just a horrendous... He's not afraid of dogs. Wow. He's full of joy. He's had to navigate through trauma. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, to me, it's holding both of the, the tension of that, mm-hmm. that. Well, that's also real. He's had to process what he went through. But God has been at work in that in a hundred little ways and in a handful of really significant ways for him to recover in the way that he has. And 
have such a bright, optimistic outlook on life. Wow. So thank God. You've been through, as I read through your book, uh, a few dark holes yourself. Yeah. And I know you're, you had gone through so much personally yeah. with your brother. Yeah. So many have lost the love of our lives or people we have loved to cancer. And I know your mm. brother went through that. And, and how was that season for you, Pastor? I think I'm still navigating my way through it because it's not old history for me. Mm. My older brother passed away. Well, we just had his one year anniversary. Wow. And you know, I didn't even realize it was the day. And on the day, I just, my, my eyes welled up with tears. Really? And, I, and I'm like, oh my goodness, it's been a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how just something about your body even, even knows. We lost my brother to a, a very difficult and prolonged cancer journey. We were only 18 months apart and kind of almost grew up as twins, grew up mm -hmm. in the 80s. It was a great era. And it was heartbreaking watching the cancer journey and the treatment. He has a young, a young wife oh, and, and children. Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, I lost my brother and then I lost both of my paternal grandparents within like three months and went through major life transition. So it was like, it all happened at once. Yeah, and we hear yeah. that. And honestly, I've preached about it. But then when it happens to you right. and you're right. trying to apply your, yes. your own preaching, yeah. this is very difficult. This is very hard. And I fell into a dark hole. You did. And I wasn't sure how to get out. And I think a lot of people feel that way when storms hit, perfect storms hit. And pain comes, you know, in a cluster. It brings friends along. Yeah. Friends like loneliness. Mm. And mm. you're like, some of the people that I thought would be there for me weren't there in the ways that I had anticipated or expected. And you have to navigate through that. I'll say this, if our Christian worldview, if our perspective of God doesn't set a seat at the table for the challenges of life, it's a very brittle belief system. And it, it holds up when the sun is shining. Yes. But when you go through loss and grief and the unexpected, it's got to be more grit Absolutely. in our in our understanding yes. of how hope is at work. Yes. And that's what good catastrophe is presenting. Not only should we tolerate pain and not avoid it, but recognize God uses adversity. Amen. He doesn't create it, but mm. he uses it as one of the great tools of crafting our human experience. Mm. And I think that's the beauty wow. that comes out of it. Mm. Do you teach us how to do that in a book? Like yes. when you talk about, because so many people want to run away from pain, like, yeah. or, or put it someplace, revisit it later. I'm, right. I'm overwhelmed. I can't deal with it. I'm depressed. I feel the anxiety. I just feel the stress of it all. I'm angry at God. I feel abandoned and I don't know what to do. I don't have the tools. I'm not equipped to know how to get through something like this because I wasn't prepared for it. Mm. So when I see a book like this and knowing what I went through, mm. thinking that this might have helped me as well. Is that why you wrote the book? To, to give yeah. us tools to help us see the hope in something that we don't have to wait for, but when something happens in our life, the rug is pulled from underneath us, we can jump into it with Jesus and know these inner details of our lives and we can experience hope in that moment, in that season. Yes. Um, I tried to lock my pain away. Did you? And I, you know, you close a box, you turn a key and I found mm. it sits there and it waits for you for when you're ready to process it. Yeah. And I discovered through re-looking at the story of Job, even the smallest measure of God's intervention in our lives brings about a dramatic renewal. God picks up our problems. God picks up our pain. Mm -hmm. And in the hands of God, it's not an immunity pass from the pain. He turns it in that moment towards our good and towards our growth. So hope is not just, I hope my outcomes change in the future. Mm -hmm. Hope is a dynamic that works in the here and now mm -hmm. to bring about the turning of the tide in our spirits and in our lives. Yeah, Amen. yeah. We like to ignore the fact that Job is in the Bible. Right. <laughs> as well as Lamentations, you know, which, which is okay to grieve. And by the way, I, I just wanna say, if you're watching mm. and you're going through a very difficult time, we have a, a prayer line available. Anytime you wanna call and talk to someone, have someone pray for you, yeah. so you can dial that number on the screen. And we wanna be here for you because mm -hmm. We're not just about interviews. We're, we're about ministering to you wherever yeah. you're at. But Benjamin, I have a, a question for you because I think we're in a place 
we can slip into a place easily and we're there. And, and that is that the, the church getting a little out, out of balance. When you hear sort of the, the good life message, I, I'm, I want to be careful because I, there are some wonderful promises sure. in Scripture. Where's, where's the balance between health, wealth, and prosperity and the reality of the pain that we go through? I guess there are different perspectives on that. Um, I think largely there's a hope narrative that worked for a previous generation. Mm. But with the complexity of our world right now, I think we need to revisit that and recognize that again, following Jesus in scripture, in the writings of Paul, in the central characters of the Old Testament, these people went through deep challenges. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot in the writings of the apostle Paul that we need to relook at mm. because Paul saw no incongruence in a burning bright hope that Jesus can change everything and yet he wrote openly about shipwrecks and yeah, beatings and right. thorn in the flesh. And here's my human experience. He saw no wall in between those concepts. Mm. And when we put them in separate categories and we say, you're either going to live the good life with God and it's going to be blessed and there's going to be miracles and there's going to be breakthrough and he'll take away all of your pain. Yes, in heaven. Mm. Mm. We need to break that wall down and recognize the normal human experience is filled with complexities and imperfections, but that doesn't mean that God's not there. God works in the normal day-to-day -day challenges and in the big crises of life. And in the brokenness. In the brokenness. You have, yeah. a, you have a metaphor in the book on brokenness involving a piano. Yes. I, I'd love for you to share that because Thank that's you. meaningful. It's the favorite little story of the book <laughs> for me. Keith Jarrett, 1975. He drives to the Cologne Opera House and he has requested the Bosendorfer 290 Imperial Grand Concert Piano, but the staff placed the wrong piano on the stage. Mm. Instead of the Bosendorfer 290, it's a small piano. Some of the keys get stuck. The pedals don't work properly. And to boot, the piano is terribly out of tune. Jarrett has a decision to make. Do I get up and perform in front of the over 1,000 people that are waiting for me, or do I pull back? He steps up, he plays. In real time, he adjusts his composition as he plays this broken piano. He works his way around so that the thin bass register sounds better. If you listen to the recording, he's, he's groaning as he, as he plays strenuously. Well, that midnight concert is called the Cone Concert. It's also the best-selling instrumental album of all time. Mm. It's sold over four million wow. copies. You would think the best-selling instrumental album is in a beautiful studio like sure. this, acoustically treated, best equipment, and yet it's on a small, undersized, broken piano. Mm. And here's the point of that story. None of us get the Bosendorfer 290 Imperial Grand. We all get the broken piano, and we all have a choice to make. Do we step up and play mm -hmm. what is on the stage of our lives and trust this, God brings his most beautiful masterpieces mm. from flawed instruments. Mm. And my encouragement to everybody is if you felt like life handed you a broken piano, how can anything beautiful come from the challenges that I've faced? You'll be amazed mm. at the song that you have to offer the world, not in spite of the problems, but because of the beauty that comes out of those imperfections. Mm. It's a great story. Oh, I'm crying. Yeah. <laughs> I absolutely can relate to it. What an incredible visual for me, being a musician, being a singer myself, I can so relate to it. God bless you. Thank, Thank you, you so much for your life, the way you've stepped into hope and then shared it with the rest of us. We need it so desperately, I think, till the time we see Jesus in heaven. And there are people in this world right now that need hope as well. And we've been able to step into those places, into those communities and bring them not just hope, but so much joy. Take, take a minute and watch this. You know, we want to give children like these beautiful children shoes, children all over the world. There goes another one. We want to give them shoes. You know what Jesus said? 
suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. You know what? We're the, we are the representative of Christ. We're his body. We're his family. And we can share his love. We love these little children. We're going to give these little children shoes. Look at these beautiful little feet. They have nothing, really, <laughs> you know, but they love, they can still play. They can still have fun. They're children. And, and I think that's what they, they're supposed to be instead of having to worry about walking around without any shoes where they step on stuff, hurt their feet, and also get disease through that, too. Maybe they just tough it out and they play. But we found out right here in this area that hookworms get in the skin, maybe where they've got a little tear in the skin, get in the bloodstream, ultimately into the intestines, and cause very serious disease and sometimes death. This, look here, this boy's had a blowout in his tennis shoe. He has played so hard and gotten so dirty. You need to wash your shirt, man. Any great, see the kids, they want to have fun. And we're going to love them with your help. We're going to give them good new shoes. We, not me, all of us together. Let's put shoes on all these beautiful children's beautiful feet. It'd just be such a wonderful gift to make at this time. And I hope you'll do all you can. Just give as many pairs as you can to bless as many children and their families as you can. You know, I can honestly say that one of the greatest lessons I've learned from my parents is when you see a need, you fill it. And many years ago, they saw the need of children not having something on their feet. Uh, not just a comfort issue, but a health issue. And they said, you know what, we're going to do something about that. And so many of you that watched this program, you saw that too, and you said, we're going to fill that need. And you know, we have provided, Tammy, so many shoes for children around the world. Yes. I am just honored to be able to sit here with you mm. and to continue that and, and to say to our friends that are watching, hey, there's a need. Yep. Let's let's be the answer to that. That's right. You know what I want to say to them? There goes another one. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Or that kid That's had great. a blowout in his shoe. <laughs> I love your parents so much. Your dad is so great with the kids, and so is your mom, and they speak truth. These kids, they just want to be kids. They just want to play. And I can't think of a better gift in this season than to give them a pair of new shoes, especially if they've never had a pair. Some of them are wearing hand-me-downs. Uh, some of them, they have a blowout, and they need a pair of shoes. So what an opportunity that we've been given to bring joy, to bring life, to bring fun in this way. You can be a part of that with us. We are, gosh, we have a goal this year to bring 150,000 pairs of shoes. We've done over 2.5 million. It's, Is that right? hard to believe. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. That's conservative. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. I, I was thinking because every time I go on one of these trips, it's just, it, there's just so many. There's so many kids and they keep showing up from every community because they're ready to get a gift. And I'm so happy to be a part of that. Do you know that it only takes $36 to give 10 pairs of shoes to children? 72 will give 20 pairs. 180 will give 50 pairs, Randy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. $1,000, yeah. actually, will provide 275 wow. pairs of shoes. That's, That's 275 children yes. that will receive a gift mm. of new shoes this Christmas if you're able to do that. And That's don't great. forget, we also have the corrective surgery. So many children would like to smile this Christmas, but they physically mm. can't. And we are able to go in and for a gift of $500, you can provide one corrective surgery. And many of you can do more than that. And I would ask you to consider that, but whatever you can do, it's, it's about, you know, we say Christmas is, it's about the spirit of giving. Yes. And really it's about being obedient to our Lord and saying, you know, Lord, I, I see them. I'm gonna do my part, whatever it is. Let's all just be a part of that promise that it's greater to give than to yes. receive. And this Christmas is a wonderful time to reach out and give a pair of shoes or give a child the ability to smile. Will you go online right now or go to the phone and make the best gift that you can? Let's put shoes on their feet and smiles on their faces. Join us this Christmas, as we reach out with the love of God around the world, give the best gift you can. 
Poverty is a killer, and because of it, children needlessly suffer, not only from a lack of food and clean water, but also from a lack of things we often take for granted, like a simple pair of shoes. Far too many children living in extreme poverty have never owned a new pair of shoes. And while that may seem minor in light of all their needs, walking with bare feet puts them at risk of life-threatening infections and disease that could lead to crippling consequences and even death. By responding today, you will help secure and make ready 150,000 pairs of Christmas shoes to be shipped and delivered to children around the world just in time for the holidays. Your gift of $36 will help provide 10 pairs of shoes. A gift of $72 will help provide 20 pairs. And a gift of $180 will help provide 50 pairs of Christmas shoes for children in need. As a thank you for your gift of support, be sure to request the beautifully crafted green crystal shoes ornament, a treasure to display at each Christmas. With your gift of $100 or more, you may request this keepsake boxed set featuring three of life's crystal Christmas shoe ornaments. Finally, please consider a gift of $1,000 or more to help provide over 275 pairs of shoes or two children with corrective cleft lip or palate surgeries. With this gift, you may request the beautiful bronze sculpture, Consider the Birds. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. I hope you are calling uh, or going online and making the best gift you can. We can make it such a special Christmas for so many children. And today, when you make your gift, if you will request Benjamin Wendell's book, Good Catastrophe, we would love to send it to you. I've just been so blessed by this, Tammy. Yeah, me too, Randy. Thank you. Gosh, he's amazing. <laughs> Where are you? You're in, you're in Nashville, outside of Nashville. In Navis, right? Yes, I'm going to yeah. come see you. It's been fun to spend some time in Nashville. <laughs> yeah, so great. Yeah, it's been fun spending time with you. Thank you for being with us. We'll see you again next time on Life Today. Stay connected with Life Today through your favorite social media. Get access to exclusive content and news with the Life Today social media experience. Um, my daughter went through a moment I thought the Lord would surely protect her from. Wow. Because I was doing all the right things. Elisa Keaton, tomorrow. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.